Thank you. I think uh, the earlier two speakers I was listening in have done a really good job of setting the context on what we should be doing in India. And I think from a policy perspective. So I'll go into a little bit more nuts and bolts of what I see from a fraud investigation perspective, some of the issues I see, and you know how we could address them on the ground uh, beyond policy, etc. So I won't waste too much time in the beginning slides around uh, uh, you know, some of the general noise, but I'll obviously share a bit around it, but I'll skim through it. Um, my purpose of my present today is basically sharing with you real modus operandi, real frauds, what I see happening today in, in the market. Um, what do we see in the environment? Obviously, that has been shared with you, but what I see from a forensic perspective is there's a lot of activity from the serious fraud office. Uh, there's a lot of activity from the CBI. Uh, even people like me, forensic examiners, are called by the CBI to explain when we do a forensic audit on a lender on behalf of a consortium on banks. I have, we have personally never been to the CBI as often as we have in the last five months. So uh, I think there's a lot of activity happening from the regulator. First time we went to the CBI office, we thought, why are we being questioned? You know, we haven't done the fraud. We haven't taken the loan. Uh, but I guess they have to also come to the facts. So we learned a lot through that process. I find there's a lot of issues between promoters and investors or promoters and lenders happening nowadays. Uh, regulators are getting very active. Uh, I know the serious fraud office has added another 100 people in their Delhi, uh, Delhi office. So obviously there's going to be a lot of action in the next few uh, two years, I would assume. Also, senior management is being held liable. You know, earlier uh, uh, CEOs were kind of untouchable. I think that part, that story has gone away. I think with the Satyam scandal, with the Reebok scandal, uh, you know, in numerous other cases, I think CEOs and CFOs can go to jail. And I think that's a myth which has been broken in India. Um, what do I see in 2015? And I'll just spend a minute on that. I find whistleblowing. That's going to be the biggest thing. You know, when we talk about fraud risk assessment, fraud risk proposal, I can tell you I've been doing forensic work for decades. And I can tell you, the, I still today, my maximum number of my investigations currently happen through whistleblowing. You know, somebody, an employee, uh, somebody outside a third party blows the whistle and says some corrupt practice is happening. I find that is the, generally the easiest or best way by which issues are coming to the surface. We were doing a forensic audit, uh, Vikram and my, me, a colleague of mine, and I actually got a 10-page letter from somebody who is working in the bank or it could be at the uh, borrower who wrote me a letter before I started the forensic audit because he knew that Ernst & Young is doing the forensic audit on this particular lender. And he told me everything in detail. And he at actually attached annexures of emails and annexures of documents where he said, please, sir, look at these documents. There's so much fraud happening. The bank has done a fraud by giving the loan and the borrower is, of course, a criminal to start with. So I was shocked that even before I start a forensic audit, obviously based on some newspaper article, uh, they have got my address from somewhere and written me a long letter. So the whistleblowing, I actually think, is really becoming a big thing. Also with the new Companies Act, it's mandatory to have whistleblowing. You cannot any longer you know, put anything under the carpet. A lot of times people would say this is not a serious issue or this is a serious issue. I think that subjectivity is no longer applicable, I think, for people uh, in the corporate world. Uh, heightened due diligence, I find background checks, at least people are talking about it. I will remember three, four years back, uh, people, I used to go to companies and they used to say, cost pressure, boss, we can't do background checks, you know. We are just about doing background checks of employees, forget about background checks of vendors and customers. Uh, when, then we went two years back where they said, okay, let's do some form filling. So they'll do some level one check, which means online, Google, uh, public source, you know, World Check, Dow Jones Compliance, Lexus Nexus. You don't get anything from that. Because in India, most companies do not have much on the web. You know, especially the ones which are corrupt. Uh, for that, you have to do things which are going for site visits, getting more documents, doing a questionnaire. I think we are reaching that level where now people for high-risk customers and third parties are at least demanding to do more than just a slight basic background check on a borrower or any customer, etc. Companies Act, I find, I'll go through one or two slides, I think it's going to change the market. Whether you're a bank or whether you're a borrower, I think more for the borrower. I think the good part for banks and the FS industry is there'll be a lot of pressure on the borrower uh, because of the huge Companies Act regulation. So I think hopefully it would make life easier for you and I'll go through some of that. A lot around transparency, there's a Prevention of Corruption Amendment Bill coming out and I think that uh, will change uh, the fact that uh, you know, people can come after you for bribery and corruption. What do we see in the banking sector? 
in the banking sector obviously you know the loan bribery thing has been going on from 2010 i don't know why people are jumping up and down in the last 3 months saying oh what a big issue we have middlemen and when i talk to bankers middlemen have been there for more than 8 9 years you know everybody knows it everybody knows their names but no one really uh, talks about it publicly so when this whole thing happened about 3 4 months back i think generally everybody if you went to any public sector bank uh people would know those people i mean it, they were fairly walking in and out of uh, banks fairly easily so it's not something which was unique to one bank or i think unique to a particular person uh so th- at least that's what i hear when i talk to people also this happened in 2010 it was exactly the same thing so we again it's very surprised that people are surprised uh because this is fairly uh, was always happening so and there's a big difference or a line between fraud as well as a bad loan you know and that's very difficult to identify at least as a forensic examiner was this loan a you know great company which went through a bad time because the steel industry went through a bad time and it became bad or was it something where it was bad to start with and the bank made a wrong decision to give a loan to a bad company and there was something wrong in the process so that dividing the line or the thin line between those two uh, differentiations is a very important aspect um a little bit about the trends you know which we see on the bad loans we find waivers obtained by corporates on key documentation so when a bank has to give certain document get certain documentation before giving a loan i find somehow whenever there's a bad apple or when we're doing a forensic audit somehow only in that case there were exceptions approved uh, got or there were some documents not available or you can't find those documents now uh, multiple loans top ups given to defaulting corporates uh loans given to borrowers through various years, sister concerns you know which i'll go through so influential borrowers you know how can you ever question them very famous promoters on page 3 every day how can you question this guy i mean he must be a very famous person i think this whole perception issue is a big problem one of the earlier presenters mentioned satyam i mean the fact that the board had such famous people and all of that that's a fact in in india we go off perception if a person comes and meets you uh and he's very famous you will be hesitant to uh, do more than the basic uh, because you just the perception is so much i'll 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 go about setting the context what we found is i'll just mention two things from the slide what was interesting is we found in our survey that more than 58% of the fraud today is committed by people less than 35 years old i find even if you look at corporates where you are giving loans to i find don't you find promoters are becoming younger and younger every day earlier you will have a gray haired person who will talk sense he'll be a little bit more humble he'll uh, you know have some more basics today i find the young the youngsters who own big companies want to become big overnight they want to double triple revenue every year that's the issue i feel more is that a lot of youngsters and now when you talk about ceos and cfos you're not talking about a ceo who's 55 years old most ceos if you look at indigo etc are 33 34 years old so the reality is you are dealing with a very different set of people now and maybe they've got their very fast they want to grow faster as we talk uh, so i think that maybe put some pressure on this whole area of uh, fraud bribery and corruption but we still find senior management is involved in 79% of the fraud so if the big case frauds you cannot do it in india or anywhere in the world actually without senior management being involved that's a fact so anybody who tells you that a fraud of 1000 crores happened in a company and the ceo had no idea then either the ceo ceo doesn't know what's happening in the business or we're not hearing the truth uh, so i think those are some facts which came out uh, what we're finding is in the uh, the only takeaway from this slide it's a little busy is at least as a forensic provider i'm seeing a lot of requests you know first you have rbi which is requesting you to do forensic audits from the big four or accounting firms on banks themselves to make sure was the npa process correct was something naughty happening at the banks etc so a lot of those audits have happened a number of different ca firms have done them some of that has hit the media some has not Uh, so that's one thing we're seeing second thing we're seeing is ministry of finance so ministry of finance has also jumped in and asked a lot of the big four or accounting firms to ask can you do forensic audits on behalf of them on certain uh, cases which they would like to look at then the third is uh, the consortium of banks themselves who are asking uh, forensic firms to do aud- uh, investigations or forensic audits on Uh, lend uh, borrowers before a cdr process is approved so there's so much demand in the last one year i've seen from multiple agencies whether it's rbi ministry of finance or consortium of banks that i think obviously a lot of people want to fix it of course unfortunately what i still see and i'll go to this i'll skip this and i'll come back to the earlier slide 
is we still see a problem in forensic audits. And I'm just being very open and candid. What we find is, <clears throat> you know, there's an expectation from a forensic audit. What do you expect from a forensic audit? There's still confusion on that. What do you mean by it? Uh, you know, people expect you to tell you the modus operandi, who has done the fraud, who's the perpetrators, what's the outcome, uh, then how much money has been taken away. Uh, one of the earlier speakers mentioned that most of these issues are export-related frauds, you know, export invoices go bad. Does the forensic provider like me have access to go to Middle East or to uh, Mauritius or some of the other tax havens to start investigating there? Obviously, we have no statutory uh, responsibility. So it's a very long drawn process uh, when money goes out. We've had a case where, you know, you have two or three transactions to the Middle East. The buyer, say, uh, the buyer there says, oh, I'm having a recession, so I can't pay you. <coughs> and suddenly you have 2,000, 3,000 crores, which just disappears. Uh, so those cases are very interesting, and, but it becomes very difficult for a forensic provider. Um, what happens is, if you don't get any uh, major findings, they assume that's a clean shit. And that's something I find disturbing, and I would just tell banks, don't take the easy way out where a forensic audit is used just as a CYA, uh, and to basically say, okay, we can go for CDR because nothing was found. It may be, if you look at the details of the forensic audit report, you may find that maybe they didn't have access to the documents, because borrowers have become very smart. They somehow have more information than we before we start. So I don't know how that happens, but I can tell you that. So when we go to a consortium of banks, I'm not making any allegations. I'm just saying that uh, when you have a consortium meeting, there are obviously 10, 15 bankers sometimes. You suddenly land up uh, visiting the borrower, and he says, yeah, I know who you're coming. I know this is your scope. Uh, so we're shocked. He actually knows much more than I do. And he also knows how to uh, derail the process because he, he pretty much tells you, oh, I'm falling sick, my mother is dying, I have to go to the hospital. There was a flood in Mumbai, so all the documents are destroyed or some lame excuse. So the process gets delayed quite a lot and he knows the timeline. He knows the pressure on the consortium. Why does he know the pressure on the consortium? Does anybody can tell me? What is the pressure of the consortium around dates? Can anybody here tell me? You're all, I'm sure, bankers. NPAs. When does the NPA clock start? I find that is the only pressure on bankers, when the NPA clock starts. And so the CDR has to be approved or disapproved before that NPA clock starts. It's as simple as that. And I'm not a banker, but I've learned that that's the clock. And I find that uh, the borrower also knows the clock. So the borrower knows uh, that um, the clock will start and if he pushes it, he will push the consortium to make a decision. And no one wants a bad loan. I was reading Bombay Times and I just read it for the fun of it, you know, in the morning. And I was reading how in some big event, a big banker of MCMD was approaching a, 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 re, a real estate uh, promoter and saying, please pass a dedo. This is a sad situation that a CMD of a bank has to request a promoter to pay some tranche of the loan so that he doesn't have to show a bad debt. I think the ball is now in the borrower's court and not in the bank's court because the banks are desperate not to show the NPAs and they are desperate to help the borrower to give some money at least so they don't disclose NPAs. And I think that's not a good situation uh, today, but I know that for a fact that that's happening. Also another thing which happens is people don't understand forensic audit. So the bankers also tell us, you have to do this in one week. Now, how the hell can you do a forensic audit in one week? If the serious fraud office is taking one year to do a Reebok investigation, another one year to do investigations, do you think a private party is 100 times better than the serious fraud office? I don't think that's true. Okay, and uh, so, but it's very smartly done. You know, you have two weeks. It's a agreed upon procedures. Just do the small thing and give us a report. So you do the small thing on the small area, give a report, and then in the media next day it comes, CA firm dash 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 has given clean shit. So we are all shocked. You know, our report was a small thing, one week around some receivable. How come we have given a full clean shit to the biggest defaulter in the world? You know, so somehow it, it's all about miscommunication and there are so many people talking to so many people, it becomes a little chaotic. So I think this whole process has to be obviously fixed and can only be done, I guess, through the IB and other associations like this. But I think it's a learning process. Uh, forensic audits are still a very immature process in India. So I guess give it two, three more years and it will improve. And transaction outside India I've already uh, mentioned. So I'll go back to my earlier uh, thing. I just thought I should mention that. If you go to a fraud, how is it happening? I wanted to share this slide. Modus operandi, how does this happen? And I can tell you, we may have done about seven or eight forensic audits in the last one year, big ones. 
I can tell you 80% of them have the same modus operandi. They, it's, for some reason, it's a tried and tested method. Everybody does it the same way. And it's not rocket science. The, obviously, the borrower takes a loan from a consortium of banks. He creates company A, company B, company C. In India, to create a company is very easy. Now, after Make in India, it will become even easier. Now, I believe you can create a company within one day. So, I think now uh, it will become much easier. So, you'll have company A, company B, C, company C, and D, E, E, F, whatever. First, they do is start manipulating the books of accounts. You know, so they start creating adjustment entries against fake companies, passing money on to these fake companies, fake expenditures. You have uh, degraded products which are used to inflate the financials to show up more inventory, more capex, fake losses from unexecuted transactions. There are many accounting uh, things. Generally, it's called round tripping. So you know about round tripping, right? Round tripping is a very simple thing that if you you can sell to fake companies and show debtors, and then you buy product from fake vendors and show a payable. So basically, you knock off the receivables and payables from an accounting perspective, and you look good. Only thing is, you don't have much profit. Okay, and it gets caught only after maybe four or five years. So for four or five years, you can actually hold a balance sheet. And I can create as much of a balance sheet you want. You want me to create a 10,000 crore company, 5,000 crore company? Trust me, I've seen so many frauds, I could maybe do that. Uh, you know, it's not very difficult. Uh, and then, what do they do with this money? It's siphoned off to relatives, related parties, etc. And it's a standard modus operandi. I mean, the industry may change. It may become from gems and jewelry to manufacturing to tubes or pipes or steel. But the general ethos uh, stays the same. I would like to, at this point of time, uh, talk a little bit of the Companies Act. How many of you know, there was a mention earlier about the fact that there's fraud in any act or any statute. Fraud was actually not defined in any statute till the Companies Act came out. The Companies Act actually defines fraud. The fraud, the main essence, I've just kind of summarized it, is basically any act omission by any person with an intent to deceive, whether or not there's any wrongful gain or wrongful loss. So it's a very broad definition. The way I look at it, it can cover everything. Now the good part is fraud has been defined for the first time. Till now, fraud, most people, when they had a fraud, they would go into the IPC for cheating, theft, or other things. But now you finally have a formal definition of fraud. And the best part is that under Section 447, you have imprisonment from six months to 10 years. So if anybody does this fraud and it goes through the legal process, you can go to jail for up to 10 years. And this doesn't only impact senior management. It impacts senior management. It impacts consultants. It impacts lawyers. It impacts uh, you know auditors. Everybody can go to jail if fraud, as defined under the Companies Act, is proven in a court of law. So that makes it a little bit more serious and for people to take it more seriously. Another important thing is whistleblowing, as I mentioned earlier, has become mandatory. So any company which has, is a public company or a listed company or has loans more than 50 crores needs to have whistleblowing. It's become mandatory. I think it's the biggest compliance a tool which, you know, corporates should be using now on a go-forward basis. Because the onus has been put on the board and independent directors and audit committees to make sure this whistleblowing works. And I, as I mentioned earlier, 95% of my cases which I invest come from whistleblowing. So I think it's a, it's a really good tool which should change some of the things. What is interesting, does anybody here know, does an auditor have any, statutory auditor have any responsibility to blow the whistle now? Can anybody share any, any thoughts here? Actually, under the Companies Act, uh, it is mandatory now that a statutory auditor, when he comes across fraud, he has to blow the whistle to the central government within 45 days. And the only thing which is confusing now to the world is, is the fraud material? Who does he have to report it to exactly where there's confusion? Does he report to the Ministry of Corporate Affairs? Third is, does he report all fraud or is it only got to be financial statement fraud? Then does he report fraud which he finds or the fraud which is reported to him by the company? So there's some nuances which will hopefully get clarified in the next two, three months. But my prediction is that a lot of companies will have delays in closing their financial statements for 31st March 2015 because it will really become effective from 31st March 2015. And I feel that there will be a lot of delays in signing of certain financial statements just because of some of these nuances uh, around reporting of fraud, what is fraud, uh, is there fraud, uh, whistleblowing, looking at the whistleblowing mechanism. So I think uh, the, the shift has happened in the Indian corporate world. Um, 
a little bit about bribery and corruption. I mean, you can't have any fraud-related uh, discussion without bribery and corruption. I just thought I'll put the context here in case some of you may know about it, some of you may not know about it. There's, the, in bribery and corruption, there are really three statutes you should care about. One is the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, one is the U.K. Bribery Act, and then the third is the Prevention of Corruption Act in India. Obviously, if you're a multinational organization, like uh, there was Tata AIG sitting here, I'm sure they have to comply with the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act because of AIG. Uh, you have the UK Bribery Act, if you were prudential, you would have to comply with them. JP Morgan, you would have to comply with them. But interestingly, if you're a State Bank of India and you have branches in UK and US, you also have to comply with it. So it is not just uh, multinationals, which is a perception. Even, I would say, the top seven public sector banks also have to comply with FCP and UK Bribery Act because they are existing outside India. I think it's an area to be aware of and concerned about because I don't think everyone has fully got policies and procedures around it. And you, even a managing director in India can be held liable under those acts because if he's aware of anything which is going wrong in those particular branches. What is the difference between FCPA, UK Bribery Act and Prevention of Corruption Act? I'll just explain it in a minute. One is, in the FCPA and UK Bribery Act, it's extraterritorial. So you can go outside India. In the Prevention of Corruption Act, you can't go outside India. You were sitting in India, you go to Bangladesh, bribe a government official in Bangladesh, no issue. Uh, you know, unfortunately. But under the FCP and UK Bribery Act, you do that. FCP has another thing, you know, believe it or not, they allow chai pani. So if you go to somebody and you pay some money for facilitation to get a license here or there, uh, it's, that's fine, it's permissible, there's no issue. So that's, there's some nuances or differences between the three statutes, but basically it says you can't bribe government officials. And uh, a lot of people actually take public sector banks, so all of your public sector banks, some of you. Public sector bank under the FCP and UK Bribery Act is considered government. That's another thing, because obviously the government has significant ownership in the public sector. So a lot of lawyers have taken the view that that is also public sector in that way. So suppose if a private company comes and bribes uh, you know, some official in a public sector bank, a lot of lawyers outside India will take that view that that's a Foreign Corrupt Practice Act issue because it's, you're a government official. So those are some nuances back and forth. Um, what I will skip this, I've done this. Um, stage management. When you do an audit, some practical experiences we've had, we find so many issues with stage management. It's like a Hollywood production. You know, just, you, like you see Bollywood movies, I find promoters have also become like that. We went to this company, this was one case, where you know, we walked into a factory, we saw more than 300 people. When we actually went to the gate entry, we actually found that there were not more than 90 people who had entered. So how come there was a big difference between 300 people and 90 people? Because obviously the loan was being given based on the size of the factory. Then when you actually looked at some of the workers, they were not in uniform, they were wearing chappals. Uh, you won't even sh they were not even sure, they may have come to that factory for the first day because they were on Dihari. You know how you can go and pick up like 25 people, 30 people and say, I'll pay you a thousand rupees for the day, just come and you know, show your face and be present in the factory. So we found that. Then we found that the actual regular workers who knew the facts, that this was a company which was very small, maybe didn't even have operations much, uh, uh, the, those people were physically not present. So you had just got fake workers present. And the factory pretty much looked like this. This is real photographs. There was nothing happening. And this factory was going to be given a huge loan. Now the question is, uh, obviously no one goes into the details. I'll give you a similar example, which I can't uh, give you the name. There's a Korean company, which acquired a company in the textile business in India. And, you know, um, three, six months later after acquiring and taking ownership of the textile company, they realized that the company was totally fraudulent. There were no customers, nothing. So the Korean CEO, global CEO from Korea came to India. And I met him, and there's always a language problem with Korea. And when we went to uh, the factory, he actually looked at the factory and said, I never saw this factory when I came for my visit. Because he was shown a different factory. So he, they, you know, there were two factories neighboring. So he said, I was shown that factory, not this factory. But they said, no, no, this is the factory you bought. So there was confusion on which factory was bought uh, by him. And he, uh, so, so I'm just saying, you, it's easy to do a drama and a whole show. Uh, there's a very famous person uh, who does a lot of presentation in the U.S. called Barry Minko. I don't know how many of you have heard of him. The whole thing on Barry Minko in the U.S. was exactly the same fraud, where he was doing this renovation of buildings. And whenever the auditor wanted to go and see a building, he would pay $500 to the building security guy and show a fancy building and the guard would say, Gee, sir, how are you, sir? You'll walk in, see the building. Auditor is very happy. He'll create some documents, give it back. So I find fraudsters have now gone way ahead and started doing these type of uh, 
activities. Another experience on stage management, stock taking. Inventory count is the biggest sham. It is so easy to make a fool, unfortunately, of the poor chartered accountant. Because chartered accountants are not experts in doing physical verifications. No, mat no matter how much you believe that they are. Because it's a very technical thing. Let's say you're doing coal physical verification. For counting coal, does everybody know it's actually a very complicated formula? First, you have to heap coal in a certain way. So if you're heaping coal in a, in a squarish way, the formula is different. If you're heaping coal in a triangle, you have to half the formula. A lot of people visually, how can an accountant or an auditor look at a coal hype, heap and say, okay, is it a triangle or is it a square or is it this? What formula to use? Second is quality of coal. You know, one is the quantity into the rate. How do you know what is the quality of the coal? That can easily be uh, forged based on some lab uh, quality guy who can be paid 1,000 rupees to say this is high-end quality imported from Africa versus local Indian uh, coal. So that's one example. We had a case where if you look at this state, this is real cases. So our team was told to do a physical verification of these jute bags. How, do you think any auditor can count this? First of all, you don't know how to count this. Second of all, you know, which chartered accountant after studying for five years and becoming a CA will actually climb onto this heap and actually do a job of counting every heap. He'll outsource it to some first year intern. First year intern who's sitting there alone having tea, he'll say, Aapi karlo, you know, to the client. And just tell me what it is and I'll write it down. So re reality is I think inventory count is something which I think all bankers should also take seriously and have a process around because uh, it, it's another area which is easily manipulated. I always say, you know, a lot of CEOs are sitting there saying, oh God, we're working so hard. And it's a known fact uh, that they bother more about how you can focus on bookkeeping. So the, if a CEO is very interested in finance, and I hear from sources that Mr. Ramalinga Raju, for instance, was very interested in accounting and finance. When you have a CEO who's taking huge interest in accounting, I would really do an audit properly because technically a CEO should not be spending so much time in accounting. Accounting should just be a byproduct of good business practices. And it should just happen. When somebody is taking so much interest in accounting, there's some manipulation happening. It's my personal uh, uh, view. I'll skip this. I know I'm running out of time and I'm keeping you away from tea. So I'll just now talk about NPAs, and I'll spend five minutes only on NPAs, and then I will close. Uh, what, what is the issue with NPAs, non-performing assets? You hear so much about it. One is lack of transparency in appraisal documents. You know, forged documents, see that all the time. In, irregularity in collaterals, you know, how do you value collaterals? What was shocking for me when I went to a bank, they said, sir, we have a process around getting three valuations. And then we get high, medium, low. Then sometimes we make subjective decisions of taking high, or we take an average. So it was amazing that you get three or four valuations per collateral and you have th two or three valuers giving you different valuation numbers and you pretty much take what is convenient to you. So that was new. It was a new learning for me in learning that. Siphoning of funds, uh, you know, to related parties standard, division of funds, collusion between customers, third parties and employees I've seen quite a lot. And the last is the NPA management. Banks are very good at managing NPAs. You know, rescheduling loans at branch level is a very standard thing. I'm also aware of it. You know, whenever you want to not show an MPA, just reschedule the loan. How does it matter? Kisko pata chalega? And then the core banking, you know, we all rely on big IT companies to understand what the back end of a core banking is. But the back end of the core banking is the real meat, the queries. How do you recognize provisions? You know, uh, how do you identify fraud in the system? When it's identified as fraud, do you recognize provisions immediately? Because you are supposed to, as per the prudential norms. You know, so some nuances around that are manipulated sometimes. Obviously, I don't have more than half an hour, so I can't go into detail of everyone. We can take it later during tea. I'll give you two or three examples. We found cases where in the public domain, even my six-year-old daughter, when goes into Google, can put in a name of a company and get all the bad news. But when you look at the recommendation of the credit department, it says, fantastic company, you must give big loan. In fact, give a larger loan because it's such a great company. But when we go into Google, everything is there. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. So obviously, this is a way of not making sure you do your proper diligence. Second is Sybil. You know, nobody keeps a proper Sybil report or even Sybil reports are manipulated. Where very clearly in this case, we were seeing that there was clear past dues, etc. But in the credit appraisal document, no Sybil issue. How is that possible? S sales tax, you know, company showing huge growth in sales. Has anybody gone and checked if this company has even got a sales tax ID? This company's sales tax ID had been actually cancelled. It's a real case. But they were showing tripling the growth of sales. Now, how the hell can a guy sell without a sales tax registration? 
you know, very, I'm giving you some very basic examples. I mean, fraud can get more complicated. But I find, if, even if you fix these basic issues, you'll fix 80% of fraud in India. Then another one, related parties. You know, you just have to be a little diligent. Phone numbers, fax numbers, address, last name. Is there any person who looks common? You can very easily find out the catch between related parties, etc. Another one is Facebook. I mean, it's, you, here we found a company where a promoter has taken loan and then given it to another related party which was owned by his daughters and sons, etc. And you could pretty much find that. You go onto Facebook, you'll find that all of them are celebrating together the birthday, etc. So it's not rocket scientist to know that he took a loan from a bank and immediately passed it on to a related party. It happened within 24 hours. And every, all the evidence was easily available. We even got photographs of them parting together. In fact, one week after the loan was siphoned out. Another thing is chartered accountants. You know, chartered accountants are taken as auditors in some small CA firms in some tier two cities, for instance, and immediately they're directors of other companies also of the promoter. So, you know, there's some red flags you can look at. How can a CA or an auditor become a director of one of the related parties? Obviously, they're very cozy. Another area is NPA management we have mentioned. You know, suddenly you find, oh my God, this big reality or big company is not paying a loan. Why don't I give you another loan at one of your unrelated companies with a different name and then you pay me this money back? So basically, company A has another company C. Very smartly, you give company C 20 crores and that 20 crores come back to you through company A. Suddenly, your NPA issues resolved. You have another six months to uh, get this money back. And you keep doing this again and again and again. We've seen a number of issues on that. Data analytics. I find data analytics is something you should all consider. Uh, it's very good. I mean, if you notice... What I've got here, the graph at the bottom, is basically showing every month, when do the loans happen in banks? So we found that loans are always happening on the last three days of a month. How come only loans are disposed in the last three days of a month? It should be generally happening across the period. And then employee customer collusion, different things, but there are different statistics on this. In audit, we use this very usefully. So when we audit a bank, we actually use data analytics to figure out which branch I'm going to go to. Because you can't cover 100% of the branches. So you only go to the branch where you find maximum NPAs, maximum this, or there are certain red flags, and you only focus on that. So we auditors have also started becoming smarter. They're not going to look at huge millions of transactions and get confused. They're going to be start doing analytics to figure out which bank to go to, which branch to do. So you should also internally think of using that as a tool. You know, for instance, NPA, same PAN numbers. You can do so much analysis using I2 and different forensic technology to see is there a linkage between accounts. You don't need to do it manually like you used to do in the old days, have 25 KYC forms in front of a table. I remember one compliance head five years back had a big chart, and there were five charts. And he was very proud of the fact for three months he has been creating this uh, linkage manually. But nowadays software does that for you in 24 hours. It, you don't really have to spend that much time. I will end with just saying it's better to be, you know, proactive rather than reactive. And I think that's been said by my earlier two speakers also. I genuinely believe it's money well spent if you're proactive and make that effort internally in an organization.